Welcome to Lecture 12 of Biology 115, entitled Mendelian Genetics. In our previous two lectures, we looked at mitosis and meiosis, the cell cycle and meiosis, in Lectures 10 and 11. This was done so that we can create a strong establishment of prior knowledge in terms of what chromosomes or genes act like when they are arranging themselves within the cell, specifically in terms of cell division. We looked at the chromosome arrangement in terms of mitosis and meiosis. But now what we can start talking about more so specifically in terms of genetics are the sort of basis of genetics, the basic ideas behind Mendelian genetics. And that's the title of this lecture. And before we go into the actual process of Mendelian genetics and looking at specific examples, we have to first speak about Gregor Mendel, one of the most important biologists of all time, his work was not appreciated until after his death. And we can begin this discussion by just talking about some basic background information on the man himself, Gregor Mendel. First and foremost, uh, a lot of people know this already, he was an Austrian monk. So he was a man who didn't have much to do uh, with his monastery duties. And he was basically, through his Austrian monk uh, job title, let's say, was able to establish some of the most important, the most crucial rules of inheritance. We can say that he established the basic rules of inheritance. And what do we mean by this? What is inheritance? Inheritance is the passing on of traits and characteristics. And specifically, these rules that he developed based off of his observations as an Austrian monk were seen in eukaryotes. So we'll write in you for eukaryotes. In addition, we also see or know that Gregor Mendel published his work in 1865. Mo mo most of his work was published at this time, but it's interesting to note that this work was only rediscovered at about 1900. So his work was not appreciated until about 35 years later. And upon this rediscovery, what we achieved as scientists or as biologists was the basis of genetics itself. Genetics is one of the most up and coming, the most popular, the most important fields of biology and you cannot begin to speak about it or learn about it in any way, shape or form without understanding what Gregor Mendel provided for the basis of this field of biology. And that's what the next couple of lectures are all about, genetics. And this specific lecture is devoted entirely to his field of genetics, known as Mendelian genetics, named after him. What we're going to begin talking about in terms of Gregor Mendel, and we can entitle actually his first flowchart as Gregor Mendel 1, we'll first speak about uh, the experimental organism that he used. The experimental organism is basically the thing that he observed, the organism that he observed display these basic rules of inheritance. And specifically, as we finish writing this down, experimental organism, we can state that this experimental organism was the garden pea plant. An absolutely crucial organism for the basis of genetics. It's very important to understand why the garden pea, pl pea plant was the choice. Why did he use this? What benefit did it provide him? Why didn't he use any other type of organism? So specifically, this model organism, let's say, this experimental model organism, had many advantages. And we'll label out those advantages. First and foremost, this model organism, this experimental organism, was very inexpensive. It's not hard to find pea plants. It's not hard to produce them. It's very inexpensive. There are also many varieties. And that makes sense, right? Because now we're going to be speaking about genetics and inheritance and variation of traits. If we have many varieties of a simple organism, a simple but great model experimental organism, that's going to help us understand the basis of genetics, just like Mendel did. In addition, the garden pea plant was easy to grow. So in his time in this Austrian monastery where he had much free time, he was easily able to grow these pea plants. And in addition, they had a short generation time. So we'll write short gen time. 
Sometimes students get confused with what this means, short generation time. It simply means that in order to go from, let's say, a parent generation to an offspring, and then let's say another offspring generation, we'll call it O2, and then O3, this sort of family tree, this family sort of generation to generation development is very, very quick. It's not hard for this to happen, and you can easily control the situations in which this happens. And we'll talk about that control starting now. Let me just get this out of the way. So moving forward, we also notice that the garden pea plant has easily identifiable traits. So we'll write that down. Easily identifiable traits. Specifically, what we mean is, if we're studying genetics, if we're studying the basic rules of inheritance, the things that we see that are inherited through the genes must be easily identifiable, like color, like shape, like size, and those were all advantages that the garden pea plant provided. It's very easy to see the color of the pea plant. It's very easy to measure the size or see the length of uh, the flower. All of these components create a very easily identifiable set of traits that um, sort of adds on to the many advantages that we've already spoken about. In addition, um, one of the most important parts of the garden pea plant was the ability to control pollination. So we'll write down easy to control pollination. Now, though we don't have much of a strong background in plant biology, we can just simply state that pollination or this idea of pollination begins by looking at um, we'll begin by looking at it by just looking at some flower anatomy. So flowers themselves have two parts, and specifically the garden pea plant falls under this realm. Flowers have a stamen and also what is known as a carpal. Male and female parts. The stamen is considered the male part of the flower and the carpal is considered the female part of the flower. So we have a male and female region for the flower. And in terms of pollination, what we usually see by this garden pea plant is self-fertilization. So we'll write that down. Self-fertilize. This is what usually happens. Garden pea plants usually self-fertilize. But what we notice, and this process of self-fertilization self would happen when, uh, let's say, the stamen, that male part, we'll just write this down, stamen falls on carpal of same flower. Why would it have to be the same flower? Because this is self-fertilization. What we are doing here is pollinating ourself. We are creating more of this pea plant by self-fertilization. All you have to do is have the stamen, touch the carpal, really fall on it, pollinate it, and then we have the ability to produce more garden pea plants. This is all through self-fertilization. But what's interesting is that you can actually control this natural process. You can manipulate it slightly by introducing what is known as cross-fertilization. So I'm going to write this down over here, and I'm going to continue this discussion on the side since I'm running out of space. So we have cross-fertilization, and I'll put a star here. And I'll continue speaking about it here. So cross-fertilization. What is it? So this is the direct manipulation that Gregor Mendel did that allowed for these amazing discoveries that he eventually was able to publish and then that were rediscovered in 1900. Cross-fertilization is the idea of removing the anthers. This is what he did. And the anthers themselves are just a part of the stamen. So imagine just removing... Um, a part of this male anatomy of the flower. And as you move that part, if you move that part, you're actually going to prevent self-fertilization altogether. So we prevent self-fertilization. Now, why is this important? Why did Mendel want to do this? Because he wanted to control pollination. He wanted to discover traits and create these rules of inheritance by literally playing God, let's say, manipulating the traits in a way that he can easily observe them. So once you've removed those anthers, what you can then do is transfer pollen. And remember, if we're transferring pollen, the whole goal of this is to fertilize, to create a new plant. But what's going to happen is Mendel is going to transfer the pollen from a different flower. 
This is the key point here, from a different flower. Notice the difference from what we saw in self-fertilization. Self-fertilization was same and falls on carpal of same flower. Look what Mendel did. He said, I'm going to control fertilization by crossing it, by creating a specific variation in which I remove the anthers, basically making sure that this plant can never self-fertilize, and I'm going to physically transfer pollen onto this garden pea plant from a different flower to see the difference of traits, to start seeing variation. And we're going to speak about that in our next video. But overall, in this first video on Gregor Mendel, it's important to understand where he came from, this basic background that we established, him being an Austrian monk, he had his work published in 1865, it was only discovered in about 1900, but we've created the basic rules of inheritance and the basis of genetics all through this work of Gregor Mendel. It's important to understand the experimental organism that he chose, which was the garden pea plant, because it these many advantages. But specifically, this is the one that you definitely want to know. It's easy to control pollination. I like to imagine that it's easy to manipulate a garden pea plant for the purpose of studying inheritance, for the purpose of studying genetics, because you can utilize something like cross-fertilization by just removing a physical part called the anthers, which is a part of the stamen, and preventing self-fertilization, and then you yourself, as Gregor Mendel would have done, transfer pollen from a different flower and see the results. We'll talk about those results as we continue our discussion.